Hallelujah. We are going to start today with the 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Man, if that's not a comforting be behind me, Satan. If that is not a comforting uh, bit of scripture, we're in Revelation chapter 7 today. We're going to try and finish up Revelation chapter 7. You will recall from last week what has just happened is that the servants of Elohim have been sealed in their forehead. Anybody remember how many? 144,000. 144, 12 times 12 are sealed in the forehead. That means it says sealed in the forehead, not sealed on the forehead. Some people mix this up. I've actually seen pictures of like, you know, because we talk about the mark of the beast is either going to be in the right hand or on the forehead. And so you see like pictures in, in modern media of like barcodes and stuff or whatever. People are getting chips implanted into them now that they can scan. I saw something that you can open up your car door that way now or something. Um, this is sealed in the forehead. It means they know. These people know. It's, it's right here in the forefront of their mind. They know who Yah is. They know who Yeshua is. They know what uh, he did for us, what he expects from us, all those things they know. And so, after this, brings us to verse uh, 9 of Revelation chapter 7. After this, I, John, beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palms in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our Elohim, which sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. So, 144,000 were sealed. That's a very firm number. That's a, that's a very specific number. 12 times 12,000. What's 12 in biblical mathematics? Anybody know? Legal or law. Governmental perfection. Right? So 12 times 12 is like really governmental perfection. This is like really, really perfect. So that was 144,000, a firm number. This, what we just read about here in chapter 9 and 10, is an unnumberable multitude. It's not a specific number. There's just so many, we can't number these people. And we read, after this beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of Jews. This great multitude is all Jews. All nations. Or it's all white people. All nations. Or it's all black people. All or it's all people living in Israel right now. All no, that's not what it says. It says all kinds of people. Look at look at what it, how it breaks this down. It says a multitude which no man could number of all nations. Nations is ethnos. That's different ethnic people. So every, eth it says all, all ethnic breakdowns, however you want to break down ethnicity, are there. All kindreds, does somebody have a different word for kindred? Tribes. It's tribes. All tribes are there. So not just this tribe, not just that tribe, all tribes are there. And peoples and tongues, all languages. You know, there's people, uh, and I'm a person who says, I think to truly understand the Bible, we have to understand Hebrew, or at least be able to crack it down to get to the deeper meanings of that. Um, yeah, but this is people of all languages. So there's no language you have to speak. You could speak Swahili and, and be in this, in this uh, grouping here of people. And so all 
kinds of people are standing before the throne. And not only are they all kinds of people. That, that's a very particular point. See, before it was tribes. It's this tribe, this tribe, this tribe, this tribe. Now it's all kinds of people are standing before the throne. It says, let me, let me find it here. They're where, they are clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. They're clothed in white robes, symbolizing righteousness. These are now righteous people. Probably key word there being now. Um, but that's what the white robes <laughs> symbolize. And what are they doing? These unnumbered multitudes of people that are gathered there in their white robes of all different kinds of people. They are united in their adoring worship of Yah, mm -hmm. of Elohim, of the Lamb. We are, reading, we are singing today, um, I'm getting back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's not what, I'm sorry, Lord, for the things we have made it. It's all about you. We have a really messed up, I even made a, a joke about the worship team today, right? The worship team, the people who lead us in worship. And so I think it comes from Christianity, because most of us have a background in, Christ, in you know, mainline Christianity, that we think singing and playing music is worship. Not really. Worship, adoring worship, is falling flat on your face in front of the Father and giving everything to Him. That's worship. And we're going to see that's exactly what's going on here. <clears throat> all right, so this is, so the fact that all these tribes, all these diverse people are here worshiping the throne, which is also an interesting thing. What are all these righteous, uncountable righteous people doing? They're all focused on what? The throne. In heaven, they're all focused on the throne, the throne of Yah. Um, but this is proof. Let's go to Matthew. Remember when we started Revelation, I told you all to read Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Um, let's go back to Matthew 24. Verse 14. There's Mark. There's Matthew. Matthew 24. Verse 14. If I had a computer screen, it would already be up. But remember what I said? <laughs> all right. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, all ethnos, and then shall the end come. So see, this is proof text right here that that has happened. All the nations have received this word. There are people from all the nations. Not all of them are accepting Yeshua, but there are people from all the nations. So the word has clearly been preached to all at this point. And then shall the end come. So that is what John is seeing here. I really think we need to think about, y'all out there in YouTube land need to think about, how this is every kind of person. We're not that ethnically diverse right here today. We're all kind of looking pretty similar uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but that's not, that's not what it's about. You know, there are people who try to make this thing about black people. They try to make it about white people. They try to make it about brown people. Probably people try to make it about red, blue, yellow, green people. Um, racism, dividing people by race, by ethnos, by tribe, is of the devil. And he's trying to cause schisms in Yah's people, and I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter what color a person is, it doesn't matter what language a person speaks, it doesn't matter um, what tribe a person claims affiliation to, it matters what their relationship is with the Father through Yeshua HaMashiach. That's the only thing that counts. And probably most of you all agree, because um, I know you pretty well, but again, I don't know about YouTube. If this man has accepted Yeshua, Jesus, as his Savior, he is closer to me than a, than a blood brother is who hasn't done that. He is family. This, this person, and if they're older, some people call Sister Kate, Mother Kate. I think she's actually going to change her name to that when she turns 60 from, from Sister Kate to Mother Kate. But it's like, hey, you're like a mother. And these are people of all ethnic, race, tribe, language, whatever, that do that. And 
we're a family in Yeshua, united in Him. And I, I think that's important because there's this underlying current out there of racism, and I reject it. All right, so they're all waving, verse 10. It says they're, um, no, verse 9, they're wearing white robes and palms are in their hands. Palm, then, when this was written, probably not so much today, but yeah, still a little bit. Palm is a symbol of, anybody know? Authority. Victory. They would give palms to like the winners of races and they'd wear them around like a wreath around their head. Sometimes it's translated crown in, in the word. Um, there's the, man, I don't speak French. Who speaks French here? At Cannes, at the film festival, like the, the films that do really well get the palm d'or or something like that. I'm pretty sure they're talking, and I, they get like a little prize that's like a little palm. It's victory. They won. They win the best movie, right? And so these people are waving palms. Let's go to John chapter 12. John 12, 12. 12 tribes, 12,000 people in each tribe. Now we're in John chapter 12, verse 12. Yeshua is making his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He has raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 11, it says, By that reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Yeshua. And on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when, uh, Passover, when they heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and they cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of Yahweh. Hosanna means please save. Save us. They're proclaiming him the victorious Messiah coming in based on what he did. And so these people were all waving palms as Yeshua is making his entry into Jerusalem. And now here in Revelation, we see these, these unnumbered multitude in white robes um, are, are waving palms also. Verse 11, and all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and they fell down before the throne on their faces, and they worshiped Elohim. And that's what I was talking about, real worship. Real worship is falling down on your face before the Father, and it's just rendering everything to him. He alone is worthy of praise. There's a lot of misinformed people out there and media and cartoons and shows talking about heaven, what heaven's like. Man, when I get to heaven, there's going to be unlimited maker's mark and dun 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 dun, dun. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous. In heaven, what we're going to be doing is praising the Father. Mm -hmm. I've heard people say it's blasphemy and they're going to get judged for it. I don't want to just go praise somebody all day long. That's not heaven to me. Heaven to me is being able to fish all day or, you know, whatever. It's like, dude, you better get serious about this. This is, this is real stuff. He is the creator of the universe right there. There is nothing more than we were created to please him. And so that is what worship is. That is what they're doing. They are all focused on the throne. They are all focused on his divine sovereignty as uh, Spurgeon said Charles Spurgeon his divine sovereignty his, he's totally in charge he is totally Yah verse 12 so as they're worshipping Yah verse 12 saying Amen Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our Elohim forever and ever Amen Notice how that worship, those words that are coming out of their mouth, all the goodness they are heaping upon the Father, if you will, is bracketed with, let it be so. That's what Amen is, let it be so. They're, let it be so, here's everything we're giving to Him, let it be so. <clears throat> That's why it says Amen and Amen, like that. Verse 13, and one of the elders... Now, my King James says answer. Does anybody have another word? Responded. Responded is good. I think asked is better. Um, and actually, it kind of means asked. One of the elders asked, saying unto me, What are these 
which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? I guess I'll read 14 and we'll come back to it. And I said, I, John, said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the angel, elder, hold on, let me get back there. Angel stood around, they're worshiping, they're saying amen. One of the elders, the elder asks him, Hey, who are these uncounted multitudes in white robes? John doesn't know the answer. So why did this elder ask John the question? Why did he ask him? Because he knows John doesn't know. And the elder clearly does know the answer. So why is the elder asking him the question? I, I looked at this for a while. I'm like, why is he doing that? Here's why. He could have said... Let me, let me give you the exact right words. What are these which are in white robes and whence can they? Instead of asking that question, he could have said, he could have just pointed at these people and said, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He could have just told them instead of asking them. Think about how your brain works. When you're asked a question, you start to consider the question. You start thinking about it. You start wondering about it. You start pondering about it. It gets you involved in the process. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, this is the Glock 19. It shoots this round. It goes, you know, 1,150 feet per second, blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Next, go, what is this? People look at it. They think about it. What kind of bullet does it shoot? They start, it makes all your little synapses fire. He wants John receptive to the information he's given him. Instead of just telling him, hey, these are the people that came through the Great Tribulation, they washed their robes in the blood of Yeshua. Um, instead of just telling him that, because John is looking at amazing. Wow, this is like blowing my mind. It's like, John, you ain't seen nothing yet, buddy. Um, but it's like, this is blowing my mind. Yeah, okay, yeah, I got it. Those are, yeah, those are them. No, he wants him to figure out, yeah, who are these people? That's interesting. And then he gives him the answer. I think that's why he asked him that. I think that's why the elder asked the question to him. It locks it in. Now notice in verse 14, he says, They which came out of the great tribulation. It's clear, is it not, that these are believers. These are believers who came out of the Great Tribulation, meaning they were in the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation, the big one at the end. They weren't raptured away out of this trip. They were there. They died. They died. They're martyrs is what they are. Um, so I, I just think that's another point. This is not an anti-rapture sermon. We could go there, but we're not today. Now, it... This is kind of weird, too. They came out of the Great Tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white. So their robes weren't white, starting out. They made them white. White is symbolic of righteousness. They made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's really weird, right? It's supposed to be weird. It's supposed to make your brain go, what? Blood stains. If you get blood on white, put this on and it'll come out. Yeah, whatever. It stains garments. <clears throat> Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. White with the blood of the Lamb. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. You know, it's considered, you, while you're looking, I'll talk a little bit. There's like almost a political correctness in Christendom. Uh, about how you really shouldn't have a favorite book in the Bible. Man, I've heard this like referred to lots of times. Oh, they're all great books. You know, I don't have a favorite, blah, blah, blah. No, I have a favorite book. It's Isaiah. I love Isaiah. There is such rich stuff in Isaiah. Um, it's, it's just wonderful. Anyway, verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith Yahweh. I mean, how cool is that just on the face of it? I get to sit down and reason with Yah? This is neat. Let's reason. Let's consider. Let's ponder. Let's 
think on the things. It kind of goes together with what the elder said to him, made him ponder on things. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Well, that's a pretty cool promise because we're all sinners. Look at verse 19. If, whenever Yah or Yeshua says if, circle it, underline it, put an exclamation point, put a star next to it, something. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken it. Obedience just comes back to that. But here is this imagery again of though you are your sins are red, you're going to be as white as, as wool. And I could go somewhere else with that, but I'm going to leave that for now. So they're white from blood. They're white. They're, they're made white. They're washed in the blood of Yeshua. Metaphorically speaking, the blood that Yeshua shed on Calvary for us, for all mankind, for all this multitude of people from all over the world, our sins are washed away by his blood. It goes all the way back to Passover, which is why it happened on Passover when uh, Moshe was told to tell the people, kill the lamb, put the blood on the lintel, don't come out, the angel of death is going to pass over you. Well, this same blood represents the blood that Yeshua sent, and now eternal death passes over us because his blood covers us, right? And so it made their garments white. But there's an interesting way this is worded, back in Revelation. These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now clearly they were made white in Yeshua's blood. But who washed them? Who washed them? They washed them! These saved people in white righteous robes washed their robes. That's work. Is that a work-based theology? I don't know, you tell me. They did the washing of their robes in the blood of Yeshua. Yeshua provided the blood, but they did the washing. There is work we have to do. We can't just lay back, make some mental ascent, I love Jesus, and that's all, you know, da, 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 now I'm saved and I can go do whatever I want to do. We cannot. There is work that is required. They did the washing. They washed their robes in the blood of Yeshua, and now they're white and righteous. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what Yeshua said. So I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, let's continue on. Verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of Elohim. This is what they do in heaven. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. Who has different wording on that? He that sits on the throne, Brother TJ. Shall spread his tent over them. I have that in the scripture. Shall spread his tent over him. What does somebody else have? Anything? Tabernacle. What? Tabernacle? Tabernacle. Temple. It will, so here it says dwell uh, upon them. It could be tabernacle amongst them, which goes back to the tent spread over them. And if you break it back to the Aramaic, go from Greek to Aramaic, it's he shall protect them. Mm -hmm. See, when we're under his wings, when we are in his tabernacle, when we are his people, he protects us. And we're his people because he chose us, but then we decide to follow. He's like, I want you to come with me, to be with me, to come up here and have these white robes. But we still have a choice. And we can say no. And if you say no, <laughs> bye-bye. That's not for you. So he will protect us. We are, he dwells with us. He, all of that is all tied up in there. And then this is why we started with the 23rd Psalm. Because when this happens, he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them, shall spread his tent over them, shall tabernacle with them, shall protect them. Then they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the living fountains of waters, and Elohim shall wipe away the tears from their eyes. That's a wonderful place to be. More especially, because it's referring to these people in particular, but by extension, all of us who accept Yeshua, these people who came out of tribulation, who life was not so good for them, and now... 
He's leading them beside the still pastures. They have the everlasting water. They're never going to hunger again. The heat is not going to bear down on them again. And of course, why wouldn't you want to worship him for saving you from all that nonsense? I think the two key points in today's sermon are everybody has the ability to come to the Father through Yeshua. Everybody. It's not a race, tribe, language where you were born thing, number one. And number two, what everybody's doing there is worshiping Him. That is the sole focus of their life, is worshiping Him. I think it's important that we remember that we are created to please Him. That's why He created us, for His pleasure. Um, We should probably do that. Let's pray.